Go ahead and dig right back into a series that we've been in over the last several weeks. We've been doing a series called Life Hacks. And you know, the, the, the whole premise behind this series is that life is not supposed to be that complicated. I'm going to tell somebody, it's not that complicated. Now, I know what some of you are thinking when you hear that. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Life is complex. It's complicated. But you know, the reality is that the, by and large, the reason why we experience complications in life is because we complicate it. It's because we get in the midst of complicated circumstances. And the reality is that God actually has provided a way for us to experience life on a completely different level. You know, this series of life hacks, if you think about what life hack is, it's just a simple a tip, a technique. It's something that we have that helps us accomplish a, a task more efficiently in an easier manner. How many of you like easy? Yeah. Come on, don't lie, right? We like easy. How many of us want the shortest path to the longest uh, situation, the, the longest uh, results in life, right? We want easy, right? But here's the thing. God has provided us a life hack. Something that simplifies this journey of life. Friends, it's called the wisdom of God. And so in this series, we've been looking at the book of Proverbs. And today, we're going to pick up where we left off. And today, we're going to talk on a topic directly from the heart of God. I promise you, I'm not here to give you an opinion. My opinion means nothing here. Don't let the title fool you. The pastor title has nothing to do with it. We are going to simply consider the truth in God's word. Today, I want to talk to you on the topic, sweat the small stuff. Go ahead and tell somebody, sweat the small stuff. Small tell somebody else, sweat the small stuff. Yeah, sweat the small stuff. For those of you joining us online, sweat the small stuff. I know we've heard the old saying, don't sweat the small stuff, right? But I dare say that we should sweat it because the small stuff that makes up life matters. Small things matter. Those little areas in our life matter. The little things we do, the little things that we allow to go uncorrected, the little things, the small stuff that we let slide, the little compromises, the little things that we say, oh, well, nobody's watching, nobody cares, I'm not hurting nobody. Those things matter, friends. They create big problems if we don't address them. Let me give you a portion of scripture so that you can see that this is not my opinion. Starting at Proverbs chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 6. It gives us great wisdom. And it says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways. And be what? Be wise. Be wise. So you see, what we're seeing here is that the ant teaches us what? Wisdom. Wisdom, right? It goes on to say, it has no commander. It has no overseer or ruler, and yet it stores up its provisions in summer, and it gathers its food at when? Harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? Watch this, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to do what? To rest. And watch this, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity, scarcity, like an armed man. If you're like me, you don't wake up in the morning thinking about ants. None of us wakes up thinking about an ant. None of us goes in search of ants. No, none of us cares for ants, right? We see them as insignificant. Would you agree? Yeah, right? We have no concern for them. We don't see them as being able to add any value to our lives. If you're like me, you probably flick them away. Some of you, you go to a whole nother level. You, you step on them, right? And some of us take it to, like, the ultimate extreme. We spray them, right? We get rid of them, right? We do away with them. But you see, God created ants for a purpose. God created ants for a purpose. And one of their purposes, friends, according to what we just saw in God's word, one of their purposes is to teach us about wisdom. To teach us wisdom. To teach us how to practically apply wisdom, to walk in life with wisdom. So in this passage, God uses what we esteem as small, insignificant. Some of us consider them a nuisance. Some of us miss them altogether. 
or we forget about them. God uses what we esteem as small and insignificant to draw our attention to one of the most valuable resources available to us, especially after the resurrection of Christ, his wisdom. His wisdom. His wisdom. It's important to note that in the scriptures, God tells us to go to who? Go to the ant. Come on, preach with me here. He says, go to the what? Go to the ant. Go to the ant. He doesn't say, go to your friends. Right? He doesn't say, go to that social media influencer that you follow. He doesn't say, go to your therapist. He doesn't say, go to your pastor. He doesn't say, go to the news. He says, go to the ant. Go to the ant. When he says, go to the ant, what he's actually telling us is, consider the ant's ways. Meditate on how the ant does it. Observe its example and follow it, is what he's telling us. And the reason why God does that, the reason why God tells us that, is for a few reasons. You see, the ant is consistent in its ways. The ant is consistent in its approach to its life. The ant fulfills its purpose daily. Daily. One of the reasons why the Lord tells us to go to the ant is because the ant practically teaches us that in order to enjoy the benefits of wisdom, we must apply wisdom. Listen, you can't get the wisdom of God while following foolish ways. We can't expect the benefits of God's wisdom without applying God's wisdom. In the same way how you can't sow apple seeds and expect oranges, or for some of us, platanos, right? That was a lot funnier in my head. But anyway. <laughs> Don't mind me, right? Listen, in the same way that you can't sow an apple seed and expect an uh, 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 orange, you can't live life without the wisdom of God and yet expect wisdom's benefits. Friends, it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, there's no wisdom in that. See, the ant isn't waiting for the harvest. The ant works toward it. That's wisdom. It applies wisdom and it receives what wisdom promises. Another reason why we see that the Lord tells us to go to the end is because the little things in life are not as little as we think. Friends, it's the little things in life that mean the most. The little things in life mean the most. You know, those little thoughts. You know, those little habits. You know, those little pockets of time that we just waste. Right? You start off scrolling, and before you know it, you're rolling for hours through your phone. Right? It's wasted time, friends. It's a bad investment. Right? So you see, the little things in life mean the most. And we have to consider why God, what God teaches us through this little itty-bitty thing called an ant. What does he teach us? What does he teach us about wisdom and what does he teach us for life? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm going to give you just four simple things that require that we should actually not just think about, but that we should meditate on. We should leave here. Man, some, somebody told me last service, I'm going to go get me an ant. And I said, you do that. <laughs> Put it in a bottle, do whatever you got to do, right? That's good. That's good stuff. But my point is that it's, no, it's of no benefit to receive truth, to receive wisdom from God's word, and then not chew on it, not meditate on it, and seek on how to apply it. So today what we want to do is simply this. We want to leave here encountering God through his word, and we want to leave here with wisdom so that we can apply it to life. Here's the thing, as my son was saying last weekend, wisdom is the one resource that you can invest and every single time, it will produce greater for you. It will give you greater results. Amen? So the first point I want to encourage us to consider, to really chew on, and to also apply is that little things make big things happen. Say that with me. Little things make big things happen. Little things make big things happen. 
Have you ever thought about an ant? Have you ever watched an ant and told yourself, the ants are amazing? No. No, not at all. Right? None of us is rushing along to go get us an ant. Right? Except my man who was here last service. But you see, the reason why we're not excited about ants is because we don't understand them. See, no matter where you place an ant, it will immediately get to work. Think about it. You pick up an ant from where it's at and you put it somewhere else, and that ant is not wandering aimlessly. That ant is not scurrying along just without an agenda, without a, a focus, without an intended purpose. No, an ant spends its day every day seeking food. You know why? Because it understands that the value of today will translate into tomorrow. If I begin to do the small things today, if I apply myself today, I can always expect a harvest tomorrow. Let me ask you a question, friends. Are you living like an ant? Are you thinking about tomorrow? Or are you robbing from tomorrow by wasting your life today? Wasting your time today. Wasting your intellect today. Wasting your strength today. Wasting your finances today. There's no wisdom in that, friends. See, the ant is devoted to the harvest. It's not waiting for tomorrow to come because it understands the value in each and every moment and day that it has. It doesn't see hard work as difficult. It sees hard work as a pathway to easy, to blessing, to provision, and to purpose. Now, I get it. For some of us, we, we overlook the small things in our life. But I want you to consider how powerful the little things are in our life. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10 says this. It says, do not despise. That word despise, it means to cast off, to disregard, to set aside, to, to, you know, look at it as insignificant. It says, do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Don't miss what God is telling us here. The work that God begins starts in small places. Small decisions. Small attitudes. Small actions. Small habits. Small disciplines. God rejoices in the small things. I remember when we first started the church there, um, you know, we started in our home back in uh, January 5th, 2014 was our first service. So our first service. And when we started church at the bridge, we started it in our home. And to the average person, they would go, this is a church? Where's the seats? Where's the band? Where's the smoke? Where's the lights? Where's all the people? But let me tell you, when we started, we never saw small because we understood that we serve a big God. This church, this ministry that God has entrusted to us, all of us, whether here or online, is built on small things. It's built on valuing the small things that matter. One person that comes to mind for me um, is a woman named Sandra. You might know her as one of our hospitality host leads. She's amazing. Come on, give it up for Sandra. She's a blessing. And I remember Sandra would come to our home, and Sandra would set up coffee cups, and she would make coffee, and she would set up pastries. She would set up stirrers, right? And she would place napkins exactly to the T in such a precise manner. Little napkins. But you see, Sandra would do that with excellence. And while we knew Sandra for years, we, we didn't know each other to that extent. But she had a heart for the kingdom of God. She had a heart for people. She still has a heart for people. And above all, she understood that everything that we do, whether big or small, should be done in excellence unto the Lord. We serve a good God. 
Let's not treat him like he's small. What Sandra didn't realize was that as she would do that, it was saying something to people. One person in particular was a friend of mine who was coming to the church at the time. And when he would come, you know, it was a small congregation. We were just starting. We didn't have our own building. We ended up in a hotel. And we were there, and, and we were faithful to do everything with excellence. Man, we, uh, crumbs on the carpet mattered. They couldn't be there. Why? Because you matter. Because God's people matter. Because God matters. Right? So we, took, we take great pride in those small details. But this friend of mine was coming to the church at the time, and he says to me, man, you know what I love about your church? He says, I love how you set the napkins. And I said, tell me about that. He says, because it tells me that you care. Listen to me. This church was built on something as insignificant as a napkin. Somebody loved people so much. Loved God so much. Cares for lives so much that they said, I'm going to set this in place so that when you come through these doors, you understand that you are valuable. And that there is a God who values you and cares about every small detail in your life. Come on and give God some praise if you believe that. Today, hundreds of people walk through these doors and are experiencing God's presence, God's embrace. They understand that they belong in the kingdom and they are welcome in the kingdom. Why? Because people like Sandra and many others among us, they get this. They get this. That they are willing to go out of their way not only to talk about God's love, but to demonstrate it in the smallest and what most people might call insignificant details. It matters, friends. It matters. It matters. See, being on time matters. Yeah. The attitude that we take when we go to work matters. What you think about people, what you say to yourself that you won't say in public, yeah, that thing that you don't want anybody to be able to plug into your brain so that we can all hear it, that matters. Because you see, small things cumulatively create big results. Friends, if you don't like the results you're getting in life, if you don't like where you find yourself in life, could it be that it's a result of little things that you've left to address? Little things that you're not letting God help you change. See, little things make up big details. The second thing I want to encourage you with to consider here is that if we do little things like they are big, God will do big things like they are little. Let me say that again. If we do little things like they are big, like they matter, like they are important, like they make a difference. God will do big things like they are little. Why? Because they are little to him. They are little to him. Let me remind you again what Zechariah 4 says. It says, don't cast off, don't dismiss those small little details because God rejoices right there. God works right there. Friends, we must be conscious that the little things that we do, we should do them as if they are a big deal. They are a big deal. Why? Because they are. Notice that the scripture tells us that the ant has no overseer or ruler, yet it stores up its provisions. This teaches us that the blessing of the Lord and wisdom's benefits do not come to those who are waiting to bless them, to tell them, or help them do the small stuff. We un the, the, the ant understands this little crumb is a big deal. What crumbs might you be holding that you're wasting, friends? See, when we treat little things like they're a big deal, when we, when we go out of our way to excel in service, in honor, in attitude, right? When we go above and beyond, see, that's where God works, why? Because that's how God works. That's how God works. 
That's how he approaches us, right? The ant sweats the small stuff because it, because it has big implications. It spends all its time storing up see, for seasons of reaping by gathering up little things. Now, see, here's what the ant understands. I cannot pick up this big piece of bread. Now, for us, we go, it's a slice of bread. It's no big deal. But watch what the ant teaches us. The ant teaches us, I cannot carry this whole bread. I can't do this all at once. But here's what I can do. I can take one crumb at a time. And one crumb plus another crumb plus another crumb plus another crumb compiled with other crumbs and multiplied with crumb after crumb after crumb doesn't just make up a slice. It makes up a loaf. It makes up a harvest. It makes up a blessing. Most people focus on getting big results. Man, I just want big results. I've got big dreams, but big dreams are made up of small steps. Big results are made up of small decisions in secret places where nobody knows. They're made up of character. They're made up of integrity. They're made up of honesty. They're made up of a value of God and of people and of things. They're made up of, of, of an integrity that says, I'm going to do what's right, even if the world says it's wrong. And that's the world we live in today, friends. Culture says, do what you will. By the way, Satanists hold that as their mantra. Yeah, do what you will. Do what you want. And so most people focus on getting big results without doing the little things. And friends, as long as you aim for big things without doing the little things, here's what you can bank on. You will, your aim will be off every single time. You'll miss life. You'll miss God's purposes. You'll miss truly big results. Why? Because you're not focusing on the small stuff. You know, the Bible records a moment where David was a young boy. And David was the next king. He was, the, he was going to be the next king. And so God sends this guy Samuel and says to him, Samuel, go to Jesse's house in, in this region. And I want you to go there. And the next king, I'm going to show you who he is. And I want you to go anoint him. So the scripture records that Samuel shows up and he knocks on Jesse's door and he says, I'm here to anoint Israel's next king. And Jesse gets all excited and he grabs all his sons, or so it would appear, he grabs seven of his sons and he puts them all before him. And Samuel goes, wow, this, this Eliab, he's so tall and strong and he's, he's in, the, in the king's army and he's in service to the kingdom of Israel and to God. Surely, the scripture says that Samuel said, this must be him. And God told him, Nope, not him. Don't look upon his countenance. Don't go by what you see because God does not operate like men. God looks at the heart. And so Elia, um, Samuel goes down the line through all these brothers, and then he goes, wait, there's got to be another. 1 Samuel 16, 11, uh, the first half of it says that Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? Are these all you have? And the scripture says that Jesse replied, there is still the youngest. In the Hebrew, that word youngest means smallest. Little bitty, little bitty one. Watch how small David was in his father's view. He says, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. You know what he's saying? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. That one. The small one. The one who has no muscles. The one who has no experience. The one who's never even been in the palace. He just takes care of sheep and goats. In Jewish culture, shepherds are viewed as lowly. They're, 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 they're esteemed as uh, um, untrustworthy in Jewish culture. Why? Because shepherds were so busy always tending to the sheep that they had no time to come to the temple. 
So they were looked down upon. In other words, David's father, Jesse, was looking upon him as he was little. And here's what Jesse was missing. I'm giving you the pathway from pasture to a palace. I'm taking you and your household through this son. I'm going to use your lineage to establish the one and only king of kings. The savior of the world. I'm going to make a way for redemption, not just for Israel, but for all mankind. But Jesse almost missed it. Why? Because he said, this little guy right here. He didn't even think of him. See, the reason why David was a man after God's heart. And why David was chosen king is not only because of his great love for the Lord. It was because David knew how to serve others in their calling as if it was his own. He wasn't taking care of his sheep and his goats. He was caring for his father's sheep and goats. He was doing what nobody else was willing to do. Friends, what does that teach us? When you do the small things... That everybody goes, that's beneath me? Oh, watch out, man. Because God will start you there. And he'll take you from pasture to a palace. He'll take you from broken to hold. He'll take you from less to more. It's why the scripture tells us that Jesus posits this. He says, hey, if they invite you to a wedding, don't sit in the front. He says, sit in the back. Don't, don't, don't go to the front lest someone else of greater importance than you comes and then you, you're shamed because they ask you to move back. No, instead sit at the back. But guess who's at the back? God. Guess who works from the back and promotes to the front? God. Friends, God wants to promote you. But he can't do that if you and I are promoting ourselves. David. Hey, hey, you you know that job that you complain about, right? That job that God uses to bless you with resources? Yeah. You know those people that you serve through your employment that you complain about, right? That you talk bad about maybe, maybe not, right? But if the shoe fits, please don't wear it, change it, right? You know those people? They are a trust that God has placed in your life. And how you treat them dictates how you'll treat what God has for your life. Yeah. Yeah. See, David did the work that his brothers despised with all his strength. And when you treat little things in life like they're big things, Like they matter, like a napkin. You'll see God do big things, like they're small, because nothing's impossible for him. Yeah. The next point I want to leave you with here is that instead of waiting for your blessing, start working your blessing. Instead of waiting for your blessing, start working your blessing. See, the ant understands harvest is coming. But you see, just because you're blessed doesn't mean that we don't have a part in the process. Right? Really. The sluggard is given to us by way of example just as much as the ant. We have two examples in Proverbs 6. We have the ant and we have the sluggard. The sluggard is, in layman's terms, a lazy person. Right? They're complacent. They adapt to life at a pace of ease. They want to do the bare minimum, and they eventually become lazy about everything in life. There's an excuse for everything, but we must remember the context of the book of Proverbs, and specifically the book of Proverbs 6. The entire book of Proverbs is about wisdom, not just any wisdom. It's the wisdom of God, which informs us as to something that we should really pay attention to, that the sluggard, the lazy person, is, it's not that just they, they don't want to do certain things. They're lazy about the application of God's wisdom. This is too hard. 
I don't, I, what's the point in this? It's not working. I don't get it. The ant, on the other hand, says, one step at a time. The Bible says that we go line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. See, you may have started with a crumb, but before, before long, your crumbs start, became, start becoming a handful. God wants to do some amazing things in our lives. But you see, we have to start working with the blessing upon us, right? Notice uh, that Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Who has what? Who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing in the, heavenly, in, the, in the heavenly realms. What the scripture is telling us here, some of us read that and we go, oh yeah, that's talking about when I get to heaven, I'll be blessed. No, that's not talking about where you'll be blessed. It's talking about the source and location where your blessing flows from. So get what the scripture is telling us this. And Peter compliments that and asserts that to us when he tells us that everything that we have been blessed with everything that we require for life and godliness right so what we're seeing here is that the ant and the sluggard are both blessed they're both blessed they're both blessed See, the ant reaps a harvest because it sows for the harvest. And while it may not have seed, let me tell you what the ant does sow. It sows time. It sows effort. It sows for the benefit of the colony. If you study ants, what you'll see is that ants don't work in silos. They don't work alone. They may operate alone at certain times, but they're always thinking about the entire colony. What would happen if the church of Jesus Christ thought that way? What would happen if we thought beyond ourselves? Let me tell you, there's wisdom to be reaped there. And so you see, the ant sows into tomorrow by doing something small every day. Yeah. And Jesus gives us a great example of how this works through the example of giving. In Luke chapter uh, 6, verse 38, it says, Give and you shall what? Receive. Don't worry, guys. We're not taking another offering. We're not doing that. It's all right. Don't worry about it. I'm not trying to hit you up for anything. But I want you to consider what Jesus is saying here. He says, give and you will receive. Unfortunately, some of us think this way. Receive and then I'll give. But watch what Jesus calls, what, what Jesus says about when you give and, it will, and, and you will receive. He says, your gift will return to you in what? Full and full. Now watch what God calls full. He says, press down, shaken together, right? To make room for what? More. Running what? Over and poured into whose lap? Your lap. Say my lap. Right? And he says, the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. So, so that, that, let's leave that up for a moment because here's what it's describing. In these times, right, we're talking about an agricultural society. So everything depended upon animals and grain and seed, right? Everything depended upon that. So here's what people would do. They would go buy some grain and they would go to the market or they would go to whoever they were getting grain from and they would pay for Let's just call an F of barley. And they would say, okay, I'll take an F of barley. And the, the person would come and they would take the barley and they would, the, the, the person would flip their, their, um, their robe up, right? Make like somewhere to hold it. And the, the person would take the barley and pour it into their lap. But then here's what you had to do. You had to shake it, yeah, right? And you had to press it. Why? Because if you don't shake it and press it, you rob yourself of more room to receive more telling us that when we understand this process of not waiting for our blessing but working with our blessing, when we give, right, what we receive far outweighs what we've given. Let me 
put it to you this way. When you operate and work the blessing of God in your life, through your life, the blessing of God will override what you can do. Friends, we don't give because we're blessed. We are blessed to give. We're blessed to give. And, and listen, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't a, just a financial uh, strategy. This is your time. This is your effort. This is your service. This is how you manage your business. This is how you operate in relationships with people. Can I give you a little nugget that I live by in my life? In every relationship that I maintain, I pour more into it than I take from it. Let me tell you why. Because as long as I continue pouring into relationships good seed, I will always have a return when I need it. Always. 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 The last point that I want to leave you with here is that the only thing between you and wisdom's harvest is a choice. It's a choice. Friends, take a moment to be completely honest with yourself. To be honest with God. What choices are you making? Where are these choices taking you? The book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. In other words, you can't override God's process. You can't get over on God is what he's saying. He says, what you sow, you will reap. You will reap. Eventually, you will reap it. So what are the choices that you're making? See, the harvest, friends, is for the ant, but it's also for the sluggard. But the difference between them are the choices they're making. Yeah, the choices. The ant chooses to work while it waits for the benefits of the harvest while the slugger chooses to wait for the benefits of the harvest so that then those benefits can work. And friends, according to what we just saw in Scripture, the sluggard is on a journey toward destruction, towards lack. It's not life. There was a guy named Moses who, at the very end of his life. God had promised him. God had told him, I'm taking you. I've chosen you to lead my people into a land of promise. You're going to lead them. I'm placing you as overseer over them. And Moses faithfully did that. But at the end, Moses made a mistake. You see, Moses had a small moment with big implications. He let his attitude get in, in the way of the altitude at which God was calling him to. And so he had this little pouting session. He got upset. He acted out of character. You might say, well, what's the big deal with that? We all make those type of choices at times. But you see, Moses was leading over two million people. Moses was the example. Moses was the lead. You might say, well, I'm not a leader, but friend, wherever you are, you're leading something. Even if it's yourself and someone is watching. And so Moses has this little moment and God says, because you've done this, I'm going to let you see the promised land from afar, but you're not going to enter it. And the person responsible for that result was not God. It was Moses. It was because of the choice that he made. One little choice can ruin an entire life, friends. And so Moses tells the people of Israel this. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. This is towards the end of his life. He says, now listen. 
Listen. Listen, Linda, listen, listen. Today, watch what he's giving them. I'm giving you a choice. I'm giving you a choice. I'm giving you a choice between life and death. Watch this. Between prosperity and disaster. Leave that up, please. Let's leave that up. And I want you to see that this speaks so loudly to our lives. Let me tell you why. Because we all have the power of choice. And what God wants to do in your life is not up to God pie in the sky because he controls everything and he does everything. No, he says, I, I, am, I am in control. It's all within my power, within my reach. But you still have to choose. You still have to make wise choices. See, we can choose life by choosing wisely. We can choose to prosper far beyond finances. We can prosper mentally, emotionally, physically, materialistically. We can prosper in every area of our lives. We can enjoy what Jesus called in John 10, 10, an abundant life. But friends, the crux that keeps that all hanging in the balance is a choice. A little things. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us here at Church of the Bridge today. I pray that you had a personal encounter with God, that he spoke to you powerfully, and that he met you at your place of need with this message. I also want to encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page. By doing so, you'll be able to check out past messages, uh, past events that we've done. You'll also be able to see what's happening now and those things that are to come. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to join with us in all that God is doing with your giving. Feel free to do so on our website. Again, thank you again for joining us, and I can't wait to connect with you next week.